church. I want to say welcome to everyone. Why don't we stand? We're going to start off by doing what Psalm 100 commands us to do, to enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So we're going to stand up and we're going to praise the Lord this morning. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. We'll praise him together. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Then on the Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels rule for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name. sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. exhortation and encouragement um, from Philippians 4. How do we live today in a world that has coronavirus, in a world that is, is rioting, in a world that has unrest? Well, the Bible has something to say to us Christians. We're going to sing it as well in a little bit, and I hope that we can truly say that after we hear this word from Scripture from the Lord. Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in the God of peace will be with you. Let's sing it as well together.
series on, uh, on, on being the church, being the biblical church. So we thought that as we begin this series, it would be a good time to confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed together. So let's do that this morning together. People of God, do you believe in God the Father? We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight By faith our fathers roam the earth With the power of saw the day where the long for Messiah would appear with the power to break the dreams of sin and death and bless triumphant toward the by faith the church was called to go with the power of the spirit to the law
Lord, as we look at our discipleship, our ministry of instruction and learning and growing, Lord, make us people of the word. May we be hearers and doers of the word. And may your word grow deep in us and may we grow deep in your word. We look at the call to be your witnesses. We pray, Father, that you will help us as individuals in the church to be salt and light in this world. Give us a heart for the lost. And Lord, may we truly uh, have open arms and open doors to people around us. Lord, may we never so seek our own comfort that we are unwilling to build bridges. And as we pray for our witness in our lives and in that of the church, we pray for the work of missions today. We lay before you our missionaries, but more than that, we lay before you the powerful movement of your word and spirit throughout the world today. The area of service. May we truly be your hands and feet. May our arms be your embrace. We pray that you will truly, Lord, help us to be a healing force, bringing your shalom wholeness. Lord, as we pray for Bethel today, we also pray for Pastor Jason and the Nelsons. Lord, as we pray for our future, we pray for their future. We pray for your presence. We pray for the movement of your spirit. Sustain them, Lord. Lord, as we start focusing on the church family today, we pray that you'll be with those who have faced various health issues, some of them known, others unknown. But right now, Father, we lay before you Teresa and Carolyn and Jim, Anna and Susan. Lord, we also pray that you will indeed surround the meters with your presence, keep before them the vision of your resurrection, victory, and power, and may that sustain them even as we with them grieve the loss. Lord, fill us with faith. Make us receptive to your word. May we live for your glory. Forgive us when we get caught up in ourselves and pride. And truly, your will be done in us, in this church, in this world, as it is in heaven. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may not understand this comment now, but hopefully by the end of the service it will make sense to you. As we have an opportunity to express our gratitude to God for his gifts and blessings in our lives, through our tithes and our offerings, you can continue to support through going to the website or mailing the check to the church, and as you exit, the offering plates will be available. But today, I just want to encourage you to be a Barnabas when it comes to your giving. And you're going to have to listen to the message to figure out where and why and how that's come to be. How's that for a teaser, right? I'm going to share with you a word that comes for me and I suspect for most pastors. If you want to hurt a pastor after a service, you're going out and you say something to the effect, that was a great sermon. You really preached it. I hope so-and-so was listening Honestly, I've heard that. Not recently, not here, but in other settings. And you don't know how deeply that hurts me. I suspect would hurt most pastors. Because generally when we do that and say that, we're giving way to blocking the work of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts and lives. We need to hear God's word for us. We need to allow the spirit to take that word and plant it deep within us, to change us, to transform us, to empower us, to do whatever the Holy Spirit needs to do through the power of the word. And when we say things like that, we're giving way to a judgmental, critical spirit as opposed to the Holy Spirit. So today, I want to challenge you, as I've wrestled with this message long and hard this week, 
to not listen for other people, to listen for the Spirit's whisper in your heart and life. Because honestly, I know I need to hear this word. You need to hear this word. Bethel needs to hear this word today. Today we're starting, as was mentioned earlier by Andrew, a new sermon series looking at the biblical church. This sermon series was something that was actually given its genesis several years ago as I listened to a devotional and kind of filed it away and kind of scribbled a few notes. And it's been something that's been fermenting for a while. And so as we prayed for where do we have to go, where do we need to go as we move into the fall season, as we move into, you might say, the, the next church year, where do we have to go? What do we need to be? And the sense was, after prayerful reflection, we need to focus on the basics. We need to call ourselves back to truly being the biblical church and to be the church that the Holy Spirit and God truly wants us to be. And so I want us to hear this not looking back. I want us to hear this looking forward and focusing on how can God, how will God move us forward in a powerful way as we move into this new church year. And the starting point for all of this is that we are to be spirit-led. If we are going to be the biblical church, we must be spirit-led. Through that, we're going to be looking at, particularly throughout this series, the church in Antioch. It can be found in Acts 11, and we're going to hear God's word to us as he describes a church that is moving in a powerful way starting at verse 19. Now those who were being scattered by the persecution that broke, broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, spreading the word among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done, and he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, called Agabus, stood up and through the Holy Spirit predicted a severe famine spread throughout the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. people of God. To truly be a biblical church, to truly move in a powerful way into the new season, we must be spirit-led. Look at the church at Antioch. Wonderful things were happening in Antioch. Antioch was growing not just within the Jewish or faith community, but Antioch was one of those places that first started drawing in big ways a bridge between themselves and the Gentile community, from the faith community to the unchurched unbelievers around them. This is a place where the hand of God was upon them, blessing them, and they grew dramatically in numbers. 
This is a church that committed themselves to discipleship and maturation in the word. This is a church, as we heard at the very end, committed themselves to service and benevolence. This is a church that had a mission heart in mind, not only witnessing in their community, but as we'll see in a couple of weeks, sending out Paul and Barnabas in mission, taking their nurturers and sending them out to nurture others in the faith of Jesus Christ and to be a witness. It was a church of missions. This is a church that was so committed that down to the very core of their beings, they were being transformed. So that when the world looked at them, what did they see? They saw Jesus Christ. This is where people were first called Christians. Now that title may not mean a whole lot to us, but that was a profound statement of the day. They were saying, they're little Christ. They look like, they sound like, they act like Christ. Wow. What a powerful statement of the transforming power of God. And to be honest, that is my prayer for Bethel. That we be so transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, rooted in the Word of God, that people will see us, and not just use it as a label, oh, they're a Christian. They'll say, I see Christ in them. We're willing to reach beyond boundaries and barriers, and show care to those around us, to be witnesses and mission involved and, and discipled. That's our prayer. And I believe that is also Bethel's commitment. Three years ago, the full council met together and they worked on a vision statement to try to map out core values and direction. That vision statement was reaffirmed two years ago as they put together the prospectus. As you're going to hear a little later on today, it is also part of their commitment now as we move forward. Our hope for the future. Our hope for the future as we move into a new chapter of ministry is to leverage our caring and giving strengths to become better disciples of Jesus, to be more Christ-like, and to be the best we can be, affirming our core values of dynamic worship, discipled children and youth, and devoted fellowship. Cultivating and nurturing the aspiration value of hospitality and adapting to our new ministry context. Our desire is to improve our ability to enfold and disciple new and non-members in our midst and to be more community-minded by better serving our neighbors in the communities we live and work was affirmed and written three years ago, confirmed anew two years ago. That is what the council is saying to us today as well, our aspirations, our goals. And I pray that is the reality of Bethel. Truly really our biblical church that is reflecting the powerful movement of the Holy Spirit, much like the church at Antioch. Now in Antioch, word got down to Jerusalem, oh, I mean, excuse me, in Jerusalem, word got down about Antioch. They began to hear about the great numbers of people coming in and what was happening there and the life transformations they were experiencing, how they were reaching beyond social and, and racial and ethnic boundaries to reach out Jew and Gentile alike. When they heard about this, Jerusalem decided to send somebody to check it out. They chose the right person. They sent Barnabas. Why was Barnabas the right person? Well, well, first off, Barnabas grew up in their neighborhood. He is from Cyprus. And Cyprus is not far away from Antioch. There's a lot of connection back and forth between Cyprus and Antioch. And, and so they sent someone who was kind of from their neck of the woods, you might say, and someone who, who understood then Hellenistic culture. He understood the Greek world and the Greek mindset, the Roman world and mindset. He understood Hellenistic culture. Not only that, but he was someone who was well-respected, and he was an individual who could very well, because he grew up in that neighborhood, known some of the key people that were at work in Antioch. Because after all, as you heard in our passage how it was people from Cyprus and Cyrene that went to Antioch and started making the link between Christ and the Greek world. So he could very well have known them. He was the right person. But more importantly than that, those surface things, 
is who Barnabas was. You see, he, he was the right person because down to his very core, he had a spirit-filled character and a spirit-empowered competence. Those two pieces came together in his life. It's those two pieces that we want to look at in more detail. If we want to be a spirit-led church, then we are called to express it in a spirit-filled character. Let's just look at Barnabas and use him as a challenge to us to be spirit-filled in our character. Our passage today, Luke calls him good. Now that may not sound like a lot to you, but you realize that he is the only person in the writings of Luke that is labeled good. So it's a title that he doesn't use quickly and easily. No, Barnabas was a person who was good. He lived the fruit of the Spirit, because that's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. About a year and a half, two years ago, I had you memorizing, guys, you know. Uh, good. Goodness. He showed the fruit of the Spirit of goodness, or he was good. Not only that, but he saw good in others. As we're going to talk a little bit later on in this message, he saw something in Saul of Tarsus. Saul, the persecutor of the church. Saul, who became Paul. He saw something in him. He saw the good in him. And he nurtured the good. Not just in Saul, but as he spent time investing in the people at Antioch, he nurtured goodness in other people. This is an important trait. Again, it doesn't sound like a lot. You know, we make it too casual. I mean, how was it? Oh, it was good. Now, what do you think of the game? Well, it was good. And, and we lose the depth and the value of this. But you know, as Christians and as a church, we need to be good and live goodness. You see, charm and charisma is not enough. What the world needs and what brothers and sisters in Christ need is a Christ-like character to the very core. And that's what we're talking about here, to show a Christ-like character. It's not charm, it's not personality, it's not charisma but it's the character of Jesus Christ. What we're talking about here is the fruit of the Spirit. Barnabas was good. And to truly live the fruit of the Spirit, we need to be full of the Spirit. Our passage tells us that Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit. If you look at Galatians 5, where the fruit of the Spirit is mapped out, it tells us very clearly that the works of the flesh work of the Holy Spirit are opposed to each other. We cannot live and walk by the Spirit and not give party to the works of the flesh. And so it challenges us to truly be filled with the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us that there is no room for light and darkness to be together. It tells us that you cannot mix uh, uh, you can't look for figs from a thorn bush and, and that you can't have fresh water and salt water pouring forth from the same source at the same time. No, Jesus tells us you cannot serve two masters. We will either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other, but you can't serve two masters. And so we are challenged to be temples of the Holy Spirit and not give any place for evil spirits to be at work. We can't. Yes, as Christians, we may stumble, we may fall, we may do things that are wrong, we may sin, and that is evil. Those are the works of the flesh. But we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we cannot be temples of the Holy Spirit and give place to evil spirits in our lives. This calls for us, then, if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, to totally surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit. In essence, we have to step back and say, this life, this heart, it's not mine. It's yours, O oh Lord. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I surrender all. Do as you see best. The ministry, it's not mine. It's yours, Lord. You set the agenda. 
This church, it's yours. It's not mine, Lord. You do what you see fit. You lead us in the direction we need to go. It is yours, Lord. We surrender all. Barnabas does that. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the ways that he's actually given himself in a huge way, reaching back to Acts 4. We'll talk about that in a moment. But that's where Barnabas is at. Filled with the Spirit, he surrendered all to the will and direction of the Holy Spirit. And then we're told he was full of faith. The starting point of that is to believe God. To believe his word. To be deeply immersed in his word. But beyond that, you have to believe in what God is doing in his world and in his church. And we need to believe in what God is doing in other people as well. We see that as he reaches out to Saul of Tarsus. You have to realize that when Saul had that Damascus Road experience, he committed his life to Jesus Christ. He wanted to go back to Jerusalem and meet with the Christians there, particularly with the leadership in Jerusalem. And you know what? They were afraid. They kept their distance. They didn't want to connect with the Saul because, you know, it may be a trap. He may be doing something. But Barnabas saw, as we said earlier, the good. He believed in what God was doing Saul, now Paul, and it is Barnabas that brought Saul into the fold in the Jerusalem church. We need to believe in God's rule in this world, his power in our lives, that the church is Jesus Christ and the Spirit is at work. We must walk by faith, as we just sang. That's the challenge that comes to us. So the question to all of us today, are we committed to walk by the Spirit? You know, as you look at the fruit of the Spirit, in about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe it was two years ago, I didn't check the timeline, that was part of, of the movement we had. I did a whole sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, challenging us to try to commit ourselves to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. And that was the beginning of a movement that, that carried on. Pastor Jason brought that emphasis to us as well to be submissive and listen to and sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is so critically important for us. The fruit of the Spirit is not, as I said back then, a grocery list where you go down the aisle and say, well, I'll pick the Cheerios, but I don't want the Wheaties. Frosted Flakes sounds good to me, but no, no, Lucky Charms, because that doesn't sound Christian, you know? Oh, you, some of you got it. No, the fruit of the Spirit is one whole piece. It's more like a diamond with different facets. So where are you at? What are the strengths? But also, where do you, where do I need to grow in the fruit of the Spirit? And are we committed to live it? That's the first part of Barnabas that we saw that God was using there, that he expressed a spirit-filled character, a.k.a. the fruit of the Spirit. But then our passage goes on and says, not only that, but God calls us to be spirit-led, and that's expressed in a spirit-empowered competence. Barnabas. Let me start with a question. I feel like Jeff White. I don't have any candy to throw to you, okay? What was Barnabas's real name? You see, Barnabas is a nickname. Anyone? You didn't know he had a real name? Acts 4.36. A man named Joseph from Cyrene came to the apostles and sold his property and gave the money to the disciples to meet the needs of those in Jerusalem. So Joey got a nickname. They decided Joey wasn't fitting for someone like this. And so they started calling him a Barnabas to the point that that became his identity. You go out through the rest of the New Testament 
And he's not referring to Joseph anymore. He's Barnabas. Barnabas means the encourager. or Barnabas means the son of encouragement. Barnabas at his very core was an encourager. And that is part of a spirit-empowered competence. And truth be told, folks, we desperately need encouragement in our world today. You look at the discouragement, the isolation, the pain that is out there, the loneliness that is out there, the brokenness and relationship out there. We need encouragers. And Bethel, we as a church need encouragers. And I want every one of us to commit ourselves to be a source of encouragement in the lives of other people. I know I need it. Thank God for some of those that have reached out to me over the last little while to be an encouragement. But all of us, every one of us, need that work of encouragement. That's what he did to the church at Antioch. You see, when Jerusalem sent him up to Antioch to check out what was going on, he didn't come up there and say, here's the three easy steps for you guys to become a clone of Jerusalem. You guys got to be more like Jerusalem. No, he he wanted to see where the Spirit was at work. And seeing where the Spirit was moving, he then committed himself to come alongside the work of the Spirit and to build upon that and nurture that and to build up that movement of that Spirit in that church so that Antioch became a unique church with unique gifts to do a unique work of God in the unique location where they were placed. Encouraged them. Empowered them through his encouragement to be all that God had called them to be. Saw where God was working, came alongside that, and seek to nurture and encourage that. And that's what we need to do as a church. Gift of encouragement. Then the passage goes on, it also describes, as we read through it, that he had the gift of teaching and evangelism, and I should have added up there, and I didn't, giving. And that's where the tie into the offering was, folks. was encouraging them, he was instructing them, and then he goes and gets Saul of Tarsus, now Paul brings him back and says, for a full year, they poured themselves into this church, teaching and instructing them, growing them deep in the word, to the point that that word transformed people, and the spirit transformed people, and they were called Christ-likes, Christians. He had a gift of evangelism, it talks about how in his ministry there, the church continued to grow across the line between Jews and Gentiles in Antioch. And in chapter 13, as we move further into this series, we're going to see that, that he then is called by God because of his unique giftedness to go out with now Paul, Saul, Paul, on the first missionary journey. So he has the gift of evangelism. And as I mentioned, he had the gift of giving. Acts 4, where he got the nickname Barnabas, was where he took his property and sold it and gave the money to the church so the church then could serve in benevolence to those in need. He had a heart of surrender. Lord, it's not my property, it's yours. It's not my money, it's yours. It's not my life, it's yours. Take it over. The gift of giving. Now, as I said, the fruit of the Spirit, we need to reflect all of it. The truth is, when it comes to spiritual gifts, and that's what we're talking about here under the area of competence, There's a long list, and the Holy Spirit himself uniquely gifts us with a different constellation that gives all the necessary parts are there. The reality is each and every one of us, if we are a Christian, if we have the Holy Spirit's indwelling, have spiritual gifts. Identify yours. Are you committed to develop and use those spiritual gifts? If not, you're denying God's giftedness in your life. If not, you are robbing the church of the gift that he entrusted to you for the movement of the church. You're standing in the way of kingdom movement. So are you able to identify your gifts? Develop your gifts? How are you using your gifts? God's kingdom. Kind of bring it home. To be spirit-led, we need both a spirit-filled character, the fruit of the spirit, and 
spirit-empowered competence, the use of our spiritual gifts. Both sides of that need to be there. You know, if you have the fruit of the spirit, but you're not exercising your spiritual gifts, it's, it's, think about it as a train track. You have two rails, right? You take away one rail, and the only way there's any movement is if you're on a monorail in Disneyland, and that's just fantasy land, folks. That's not reality, okay? And so if you have the fruit of the spirit, and people go, oh, isn't he sweet? Isn't he not? They're great. But we're not exercising those spiritual gifts. The train doesn't move. The kingdom doesn't advance. The church is held back. We need to use our spiritual gifts alongside the fruit of the Spirit. On the other side of the coin, if we're using our spiritual gifts without the fruit of the Spirit, we often lose sight of the fact that those gifts were given to us for the advancement of his kingdom and the glory of his name. And if you try to move a train and you take away one rail, it derails. No, we need to bring both sides together. And that's part of what I struggled with. As I worked in this message this week, in fact, some of the people in the office will tell you that I came very close to saying I can't preach this. I don't want us to hear it for someone else. I want to hear it for ourselves. And so I turned it back on myself. It weighed heavy on me. It sat on my heart. It challenged me. In some respects, it virtually broke me. Because I was broken. I hear this for our lives, for ourselves. For our church, not looking back, but for God's leading here in this place. Convinced. Amen? This doesn't happen by accident. It calls for us to a commitment. It calls us to commit to develop and grow and use these gifts. But for that to happen, we have to also commit to be spiritual disciples of God, commit to spiritual disciplines, to be about prayer, to be about the word, to be about worship. A lot of the things that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks, we have to commit ourselves to the spiritual disciplines so the spirit can be at work in our hearts and lives. And as the spirit is at work in our hearts and lives, that then ultimately we do reflect all of that spiritual gifts and the spiritual competence and when we do that a spirit-filled character plus a spirit-empowered competence as we look at Antioch and my prayer for Bethel is that we will see spirit-sized results let's pray Lord we just ask that you work your perfect work in our hearts and lives don't allow us off the hook easily May the truth of your word weigh on us. As it weighs on us, drive us to our knees in confession. But also then lift us up from our knees in your empowerment and in your grace. Renew us and transform us so that the people around us clearly see that we are Christ-like, that we are little Christ, that we indeed are Christians. So, Lord, we offer our gifts, our spiritual gifts. We seek the fruit of the Spirit, and we look to you to have a powerful and large movement in our lives, in Bethel, and in our world and community. We pray all of us in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the 
presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Holy Spirit, come abide within. May your joy be seen in all I do. Love enough to cover every in each thought and deed and attitude. Kindness to the greatest and the least. Gentleness that sows the path of peace. Turn my striving into works of grace. Hold of God, show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit, from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show your power once again on earth, cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of our prayers arise, lead us on the road of sacrifice that in unity the face of Christ will be clear for all the world to see Following God's parting benediction and our doxology of response to God for his gospel work in our lives, we want to give our visitors permission to feel free to exit as we invite uh, as members that we have an opportunity to take our seats and to hear a letter from the council. That said, let's seek the Lord's work and blessing in our lives. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us with everything good, working in us that which is pleasing in sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. Let earth and heaven be saints proclaim the power and might of his great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Praise God.
Praise to the King, His throne transcends, His crown and kingdom never end. Now and throughout eternity, I'll praise the One who died. Praise Father, Son, and Holy 